Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am still Tali Viezer, Artistic Director of Red Monkey Theatre Group. You may remember me from never playing any characters who live in the 21st century. Uh, first things first, do you have your beverage? If not, why not? You can pause the thing and go get a beverage, and we will wait for you. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of developments since we last met. Uh, I have a lovely haircut, courtesy of my wife. Uh, do you like it? I think it's very nice. Um, secondly, our what was going to be our June production of Sherlock Holmes' The Adventure of the Copper Beaches at Bartow Pell Mansion Museum uh, has moved, fingers crossed, to uh, August, uh, later on in August. Um, if you have a ticket to that show, uh, your ticket will be honored in August. If you can't make it in August, you can get a full refund. Um, we're also making some changes for those of you who have attended uh, our Sherlock Holmes plays previously at Bartow Pell Museum. This will be a little different. Um, attendance for each performance has been lowered to just 20 people um, because we think there will still be some social distancing in place in August. So this will allow us to honor that. Um, and we will not be moving into all of the smaller rooms in the mansion. The whole show will take place either outdoors or just in the one large uh, parlor room on the ground floor of the mansion that will again provide ample space to spread out. So um, if you have a ticket and need it rescheduled or refunded, or if you would like to purchase a ticket for that production, uh, which is uh, on sale right now, uh, you can visit the Bartow Pell website. Um, I'll, I'll put the link in the, um, uh, in the uh, comments section uh, below um, to our website, which has all of the details about the changes and everything. Uh, thank you very much, and without further ado, here is the thrilling conclusion of A Case of Identity, Part 2. Sherlock Holmes sat silent for a few minutes, with his fingertips still pressed together, his legs stretched out in front of him, and his gaze directed upwards to the ceiling. Then he took down from the rack the old and oily clay pipe, which was to him as a counsellor, and having lit it, he leaned back in his chair with the thick blue cloud wreaths spinning up from him and a look of infinite languor on his face. Quite an interesting study, that maiden, he observed. I found her much more interesting than her little problem, which, by the way, is rather a trite one. You will find a parallel case if you consult my index in Andover in 77, and there was something of the sort of the Hague last year. Old as is the idea, however, there were one or two details which were new to me, but the maiden herself was most instructive. You appeared to read a good deal upon her, which was quite invisible to me, I remarked. Not invisible, but unnoticed, Watson. You did not know where to look, and so you missed all that was important. I can never bring you to realize the importance of sleeves, the suggestiveness of thumbnails, or the great issues that may hang from a bootlace. Now, what would you gather from that woman's appearance? Describe it. Oh, well, she had a slate-colored, broad-brimmed straw hat with a feather of brickish red. Uh, her jacket was black, with black beads sewn upon it, and a fringe of little black jet ornaments. Her dress was brown, uh, rather darker than coffee colour, with a little purple plush at the neck and sleeves. Uh, her gloves were greyish and were worn through at the right forefinger. Uh, her boots I didn't observe. She had a small, round, uh, hanging gold earrings and a general air of being fairly well-to-do in a vulgar, comfortable, easy-going way. Sherlock Holmes clapped his hands softly together and chuckled. Upon my word, Watson, you are coming along wonderfully. You have really done very well indeed. It is true that you have missed everything of importance, but you have hit upon the method, and you have a quick eye for colour. Never trust to general impressions, my boy, but concentrate yourself upon details. My first glance is always at a woman's sleeve. In a man, it is perhaps better to take the knee of the trouser. As you observe, this woman had plush upon her sleeves, which is the most useful material for showing traces. The double line a little above the wrist, where the typewriter presses against the table, was beautifully defined. 
The sewing machine of the hand type leaves a similar mark, but only on the left arm, and on the side of it farthest from the thumb, instead of being right across the broadest part, as this was. I then observed at her face, and I then glanced at her face, and observing the dint of a pince-nez at either end of her nose, I ventured a remark upon short sight and typewriting, which seemed to surprise her. It surprised me, but surely it was very obvious. I was then very much surprised and interested upon glancing down to observe that, though the boots which she was wearing were not unlike each other, they were really odd ones, the one having a slightly decorated toe cap and the other a plain one. One was buttoned only in the lower two buttons out of five, the other are the first, third, and fifth. Now, when you see that a young lady, otherwise neatly dressed, has come away from home with odd boots, half-buttoned, it is no great deduction to say that she came away in a hurry. <laughs> what else? I asked, keenly interested, as I always was, by my friend's incisive reasoning. I noted in passing that she had written a note before leaving home, but after being fully dressed. You observe that her right glove was torn at the forefinger, but you do not apparently see that both glove and finger were stained with violet ink. She had written in a hurry and dipped her pen too deep. It must have been this morning, or the mark would not remain clear upon the finger. All this is amusing, though rather elementary. But I must go back to business, Watson. Would you mind reading the advertised description of Mr. Hosmer Angel? I held up the little printed slip to the light. Missing, it said. On the morning of the 14th, a gentleman named Hosmer Angel, about five foot seven inches in height, strongly built, sallow complexion, black hair, a little bald in the center, bushy black side whiskers and mustache, uh, tinted glasses, slight infirmity of speech, was dressed when last seen in black frock coat faced with silk, black waistcoat, gold Albert chain and grey Harris tweed trousers with brown gaiters over elastic sided boots. Known to have been employed in an office in Leadenhall Street. Anybody bringing etc etc. That will do, said Holmes. As to the letters, he continued, glancing over them, they are very commonplace. Absolutely no clue in them to Mr. Angel, say that he quotes Balzac once. There is a remarkable point, however, which will no doubt strike you. They are typewritten, I remarked. Not only that, but the signature is typewritten. Look at the neat little Hosmer Angel at the bottom. There is a date, you see, but no superscription except Leadenhall Street, which is rather vague. The point about the signature is very suggestive. In fact, we may call it conclusive. What, my dear fellow? Is it possible you do not see how strongly it bears upon the case? I cannot say that I do, unless it were that he wished to be able to deny his signature if an action for breach of promise were instituted. No, that was not the point. However, I shall write two letters which should settle the matter. One is to a firm in the city, the other is to a young lady's stepfather, Mr. Windybank, asking him whether he could meet us here at six o'clock tomorrow evening. It is just as well that we should do business with the male relatives. And now, Doctor, we can do nothing until the answers to those letters come so we may put our little problem upon the shelf for the interim. I had so many reasons to believe in my friend the subtle powers of reasoning and extraordinary energy in action that I felt that he must have some solid grounds for the assured and easy demeanor with which he treated the singular mystery which he had been called upon to fathom. Once only had I known him to fail in the case of the King of Bohemia and of the Irene Adler photograph. But when I looked back to the weird business of the sign of four, and the extraordinary circumstance connected with the study in Scarlet, I felt it would be a strange tangle indeed, which he could not unravel. I left him then, still puffing at his black clay pipe, with the conviction that when I came again on the next morning, I would find that he held in his hands all the clues which would lead up to the identity of the disappearing bridegroom of Miss Mary Sutherland. A professional case of great gravity was engaging my whole attention at the time, and the whole of the next day I was busy at the bedside of the sufferer. It was not until close upon six o'clock that I found myself free and was able to spring into a hansom and drive to Baker Street, half afraid that I might be too late to assist at the denouement of the little mystery. I found Sherlock Holmes alone, however, half asleep, with his long, thin form curled up in the recesses of his armchair. A formidable array of bottles and test tubes with a pungent, cleanly, with a pungent, cleanly smell of hydrochloric acid told me that he had spent his day in the chemical work which was so dear to him. Well, have you solved it? I asked as I entered. Yes, it was the bisulfate of Beritia. No, no, the mystery, I cried. Oh, that. I thought of the salt that I had been working on. There was never any mystery in the matter, although, as I said yesterday, some of the details are of interest. The only drawback is that there is no law, I fear, that can touch the scoundrel. 
Who was he then? And what was his object in deserting Miss Sutherland? The question was hardly out of my mouth, and Holmes had not yet opened his lips to reply, when we heard a heavy footfall in the passage and a tap at the door. This is the girl's stepfather, Mr. James Winderbank, said Holmes. He has written me to say that he would be here at six. Come in! The man who entered was a sturdy, middle-sized fellow, some thirty years of age, clean-shaven and sallow-skinned, with a bland, insinuating manner and a pair of wonderfully sharp and penetrating grey eyes. He shot a questioning glance at each of us, placed his shiny top hat upon the sideboard, and with a slight bow, sidled down to the nearest chair. Good evening, Mr. James Windebank, said Holmes. I think that this typewritten letter is from you, in which you made an appointment with me for six o'clock. Yes, sir. I am afraid that I am a little late, but I am not quite my own master, you know. I am sorry that Miss Sutherland has troubled you about this little matter, for I think it is far better not to wash linen of the sort in public. I was, it was quite against my wishes that she came, but she is a very excitable, impulsive girl, as you may have noticed, and she is not easily controlled when she has made up her mind on a point. Of course, I do not mind you so much, as you are not connected with the official police, but it is not pleasant to have a family misfortune like this noised abroad. Besides, it is a useless expense, for how could you possibly find this Hosler angel? On the contrary, said Holmes quietly, I have every reason to believe that I will succeed in discovering Mr. Hosmer Angel. Mr. Windebank gave a violent start and dropped his gloves. I am delighted to hear it, he said. It is a curious thing, remarked Holmes, that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting. Unless they are quite new, no two of them write exactly alike. Some letters get more warm than others, and some wear only on one side. Now, you remark in this note of yours, Mr. Windebank, that in every case there is some little slurring uh, over the E and a slight defect in the tail of the R. There are fourteen other characteristics, but these are the most obvious. We do all our correspondence with this machine at the office, and no doubt it is a little worn. Our visitor answered, glancing keenly at Holmes with his bright little eyes. And now I will show you what is really a very interesting study, Mr. Windebank, Holmes continued. I think of writing another little monograph some of these days on the typewriter and its relation to crime. It is a subject to which I have devoted some little attention. I have here four letters which purport to come from the missing man. They are all typewritten. In each case, not only are the E's slurred and the R's tailless, but you will observe, if you care to use my magnifying lens, that fourteen other characteristics to which I have alluded are there as well. Mr. Windebank sprang out of his chair and picked up his hat. I cannot waste time over this sort of fantastic talk, Mr. Holmes, he said. If you can catch the man, catch him, and let me know when you've done it. Certainly, said Holmes, stepping over and turning the key in the door. I let you know, then, that I have caught him. What? Where? shouted Windebank, turning white to his lips and glancing about him like a rat in a trap. Oh, it won't do. Really, it won't, said Holmes suavely. There is no possible getting out of it, Mr. Windebank. It is quite too transparent. And it was a very bad compliment when you said that it was impossible for me to solve so simple a question. That's right. Sit down and let us talk it over. Our visitor collapsed into a chair with a ghastly face and a glitter of moisture on his brow. It's, it's not actionable, he stammered. I am very much afraid that it is not, but between ourselves, Windebank, it was as cruel and selfish and heartless a trick, in a petty way, as ever came before me. Now let me just run over the course of events, and you will contradict me if I am wrong. The man sat huddled up in his chair, with his head sunk upon his breast like one who was utterly crushed. Holmes stuck his feet up on the corner of the mantelpiece, and leaning back with his hands in his pockets, began talking, uh, rather to himself, as it seemed, than to us. The man married a woman very much older than her, himself for her money, said he, and enjoyed the use of the money of the daughter as long as she lived with her, them. It was a considerable sum for people in their position, and the loss of it would have made a serious difference. It was worth an effort to preserve it. The daughter was of a good, amiable disposition, but affectionate and warm-hearted in her ways, so that it was evident that with her fair personal advantages and her little income, she would not be allowed to remain single long. 
Now, her marriage would mean, of course, the loss of a hundred a year. So what does her stepfather do to prevent it? He takes the obvious course of keeping her at home and forbidding her to seek the company of people her own age. But soon he found that that would not answer forever. She became restive, insisted upon her rights, and finally announced her positive intention of going to a certain ball. What does her clever stepfather do then? He conceives of an idea more creditable to his head than to his heart. With the connivance and assistance of his wife, he disguised himself, covered those keen eyes with tinted glasses, masked the face with a moustache and a pair of bushy whiskers, sunk that clear voice into an insinuating whisper, and doubly secure on account of the girl's short sight, he appears as Mr. Hosmer Angel, and keeps off other lover lovers by making love himself. It was only a joke at first, groaned our visitor. We never thought that she would have been so carried away. Very likely not. However that may be, the young lady was very decidedly carried away. Having made up her mind that her stepfather was in France, the suspicion of treachery never for an instant entered her mind. She was flattered by the gentleman's attentions, and the effect was increased by the loudly expressed admiration of her mother. Then Mr. Angel began to call for it was obvious that the matter should be pushed as far as it would go if a real effect were to be produced. There were meetings and an engagement which would finally secure the girl's affections from turning toward anyone else. But the deception could not be kept up forever. These pretended journeys to France were rather cumbrous. The thing to do was clearly to bring the business to an end and in such a dramatic manner that it would leave a permanent impression upon the young lady's mind and prevent her from looking up any other suitor for some time to come. Hence those vows of fidelity exacted upon a testament, and hence also the allusions to a possibility of something happening on the very morning of the wedding. James Winderbank wished Miss Sutherland to be so bound to Hosmer Angel and so uncertain as to his fate that for ten years to come at any rate she would not listen to another man. As far as the church door he brought her, and then, as he could go no further, he conveniently vanished away by the old trick of stepping in at one door of a four-wheeler and out at the other. I think that that was the chain of events, Mr. Windybank. Our visitor had recovered something of his assurance while Holmes had been talking, and he rose now from his chair with a cold sneer upon his pale face. It may be so, Mr. Holmes, or it may not, Mr. Holmes, said he. But you are so very sharp, you ought to be sharp enough to know that it is you who are breaking the law now, and not me. I have done nothing actionable from the first, but as long as you keep that door locked, you lay yourself open to an action for assault and illegal constraint. The law cannot, as you say, touch you, said Holmes, unlocking and throwing open the door. Yet there never was a man who deserved punishment more. If the young lady has a brother or a friend, he ought to lay a whip across your shoulders. By Jove, he continued, flushing up with a sight of the bitter sneer upon the man's face. It is not part of my duties to my client, but he has a hunting crop handy, and I think I shall just treat myself to... He took two swift steps to the whip, but before he could grasp it, there was a wild clatter of steps upon the stairs, heavy hall door banged, and from the window we could see Mr. James Windebank running at the top of his speed down the road. That's a cold-blooded scoundrel, said Holmes, laughing, as he threw himself down into his chair once more. That fellow will rise from crime to crime until he does something very bad and ends up on the gallows. This case has, in some respects, been not entirely devoid of interest. I cannot now entirely see all the steps in your reasoning, I remarked. Well, of course, it was obvious from the first that this Mr. Hosmer Angel must have some strong object for his curious conduct, and it was equally clear that the only man who really profited from the incident, as far as we could see, was the stepfather. Then, the fact that two men were never together, that the one always appeared when the other was away, was suggestive. So were the tinted spectacles and the curious voice which both hinted at a disguise, as did the bushy whiskers. My suspicions were all confirmed by his peculiar action in typewriting his signature, which of course inferred that his handwriting was so familiar to her that she would recognise even the smallest sample of it. You see, all these isolated facts, together with many minor ones, all pointed in the same direction. And how did you verify them? Having once spotted my man, it was easy to get corroboration. I knew the firm from which, from which this man worked. Having taken the printed description, I eliminated everything from it which could be the result of a disguise. The whiskers, the glasses, the voice, and sent it to the firm with a request 
that they would inform me whether it answered to the description of any of their travellers. I had already noticed the peculiarities of the typewriter, and I wrote to the man himself at his business address, asking him if he would come here. As I expected, his reply was typewritten, and revealed the same trivial but characteristic defects. The same post brought me a letter from West House and Marbank, of Fenchurch Street, saying that the description tallied in every respect with that of their employee, James Windebank. Voila tout! And Miss Sutherland. If I tell her she will not believe me, you may remember the old Persian saying, there is a danger for him who taketh the tiger cub, and danger also for whoso snatches a delusion from a woman. There is as much sense in Hafiz as in Horace, and as much knowledge of the world. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. Uh, I will be back very soon with the next adventure, the Boscombe Valley Mystery. Until then, have a good evening. Stay safe. Love to everybody. Good night.